Turns her off. Uh, today's guest uh, will be Ken Troop. Now, Ken Troop has done sales training for quite a bit. He's done a lot of data sales lately, but he's also worked with the Coyotes and the Texas Rangers, and he has a philosophy that I totally agree with, which is actually selling the product rather than giving it away. If you are giving away your tickets, please do not talk to me. Anyway, uh, but this is Ken Troop. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Troy. Troy kind of stole my thunder at the bathroom break there because I was going to have everybody stand up and stretch their legs and we we're going to take one giant selfie. So we're still going to do that. But I think we're going to have to break this into two different, uh, two different sections of selfies. So I'm going to get up here to get a little more. I'm not going to fall, I swear. To get a little more. So everybody squeeze in on this side. We're going to do this side of the room first. Everybody stand up. Stand up. This is going to be very interactive. I'm not a good presenter, so we're going to be talking nonstop and making it interactive. All right, ready? One, two, and three. All right, now uh, you guys got to stand up over here. The middle's got to go that way a little bit. All right. Ready? One, two, and three. Bill, smile. All right, great. Thank you, thank you. All right, whoop, got ahead of myself here. All right, so I'm gonna talk about kind of three keys that I've found through my career, and I came up Ticket Sales 101 guy. I've done exactly what you guys have done. Um, started 22, 21 years ago now. My very first day, um, after doing a couple of minor league stops, my first day at the Texas Rangers, I was given a phone book and a phone. Basically, no internet before the internet, so you really had to learn how to be self-sufficient. And I don't think, you know, Brett was talking, he's very good, very polished. These guys were presenting very good. I never consider myself a classic salesman. I don't think I'm good at sales at all. I just try to treat people like I want to be treated. And that was kind of the philosophy that I had, um, kind of, that first day at the Rangers when I started to uh, open that phone book and figure out who I was going to call. So I'm going to talk about kind of professional development. We're not going to talk about sales 101, although we're going to have some sales in here, but kind of three keys to kind of building your, uh, building your brand, so to speak. I have kind of reinvented myself a few times. I'm kind of, most people know me, a lot of people know me as a ticket sales guy. Um, most people, a lot of people, most people know me now as a social media expert, which there's no such thing as an expert because social media is changing every single day. Um, so if anybody ever comes and says they're an expert in social media, just kind of run to the hills because no one knows. And now I'm rebranding myself again as a programmatic marketing retargeting expert. Um, and so what we're going to talk about is kind of three different leg things to do. Um, all right, so here's kind of just classic, classic sales 101, right, that everybody kind of talks about that you've probably seen at some point during a presentation or read in a book or whatever from uh, Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, you know, put the coffee down, coffee's for closers, kind of that fear monger mentality to leadership, um, which is completely opposite of my servant leadership kind of style. Um, that people kind of learn from. And then there's uh, Vin Diesel over here back in his slimmer, slimmer days, I guess, and uh, kind of teaching people. And he's having a good conversation. Everyone ever seen Boiler Room? If you've never seen Glengarry Glenn Ross in Boiler Room and you're in sales, you need to go see these two movies. Everybody seen them? Who hasn't seen them? No? OK, go see them. They're very good. But again, Vin, Vin Diesel is, uh, you know, having a nice conversation and leading the conversation and leading them down the path to sales. So this is kind of a thing about that people talk about with Sales 101. And then uh, this was going to be funnier if, if Sheraton was actually in the room. Um, Tom Sheraton with the White Sox, if anybody knows him. <laughs> it's going to be funny if he was here, but he's not here. So everybody laugh. <laughs> um, OK. so. The three keys to me, and this is important, the number one key when you're learning um, and building yourself as a professional sales rep is to sell. 
right? So you got to find a way to be successful and put money on the board, right? Who um, wants to share a successful sales story? You got to, come on, I'm going to put you on the spot. Okay, so he, he, he took a, a, a relationship with an individual early buyer, fan of the game, and then built it into a, into a full season ticket, or kind of built a relationship and grew that over time, right? Yeah, the biggest success is I feel like fighting for the road, so that's the biggest thing. Keep giving me like Good, good. That's a, a, a really uh, important, I think, philosophy with getting to know your clients, we're going to talk about this a little bit, getting to know your customers and kind of having a plan for them and knowing what their needs are so you can kind of build them over time. Um, what's a sales failure? Right, right here. What, what, how, have you been on, right here, yeah, you, you. Yeah, yeah, no, no, to the left. You, you can answer as well. No, you. Yes, yes, sorry. <laughs> what, what is something, what is a sales mistake that you've made that you've learned from and corrected? Okay, so then you, you, you did a nice job with communicating with them and then basically clearly explaining what the issue was and what it's wrong. I have a, f a theory that it's okay to say no as long as you clearly explain, you know, what the policy is or why that seat's not available or what that, you know, price break or whatever, clearly explain no and you kind of build that rapport. It's all about building rapport with your, with your customers. Um, who, is everybody in here full menu sales or just very selective suites or groups or season tickets or full menu? Full menu. So uh, when I was selling, I had the goal, um, I wanted to be number one in something, whether it was partial seasons or full, it was full seasons for me because I was a John Spolster 101 kind of guy that, you know, I want to sell out the house as quick as I can so sell as many full season tickets as possible. But I wanted to be number one in full seasons and I want to be number three in every, everything else, or in the top three and everything else, which ultimately always kind of got me right at the top of the leaderboard, um, you know, with total revenue and total tickets in my sales, in the sales room that I was in. And that's the number one goal, I think, is you gotta figure a way to put up money and be able to sell, because that's gonna open up other opportunities. That's gonna um, put you in uh, an opportunity to get with your boss and take on some more responsibility and things like that and really kind of grow your, grow your career. So when you're first starting out, because a lot of people are very younger kind of in this, in this uh, room right now. I know the 49ers over here, they're all, I think the collective age is probably like 24 over here or something. But um, they're all motivated not by cash, but by flex hours and, uh, you know, food raves and things like that. That's what motivates these people over here. But... Um, your number one goal is to try to put up revenue. So I'm a big believer that you need to be self-sufficient. Um, that's really, everybody's gonna be right here in a sales room, right? It's the ones that get up here are the ones that are self-sufficient and they learn how to develop a, um, leads and how to grow business of their current clients and how to get referrals. I was never a sales rep that made um, you know, the 85 to 120 required phone calls a day. I always probably made half of those, but I still outsold everybody else because I took a little bit of a time to kind of understand the process and understand who I was trying to sell and then get to know my client and um, treat them well. And then I got a lot of referrals and a lot of repeat business. It's all about the repeat business. So again, number one thing that you need to do is professional development is to sell. This is a big one too, and kind of off script here because I didn't really 
map this out very well in my head. So <laughs> we're going to go back through selling, back through continued uh, learning. But continued learning is a big one, whether it's self-teaching and you know, learning from books and things like that, or going back to school and getting a formal education or a formal master's or something like that. And then having a plan of attack. So sell, continue learning, have a plan of attack. I think these are the three most important things that you can focus on to build your professional, your professional career. Oh, I forgot to mention, so at the bottom, should have made that a little bit bigger maybe, but that's my Twitter at KT Sports Market. So please, everybody should be tweeting using the established hashtag for uh, the conference and for this sales boot camp. Um, it's all about, we're gonna get into this a little bit later about you should be trying to build your brand and, and get your voice out there. This is a great opportunity to network with people and to find and share ideas and find people that you might work with, work for, or hire someday. So, you know, I encourage you to get on Twitter. So if you have any questions or specific questions, feel free to tweet me at, at KT Sports Market. Okay, so we're gonna dive in a little more to sell. Who, who, what, what defines success? in your particular sales department? Alexis, Alex. Yes. All right. What, uh, let's see, Bill Grutin. What, uh, what do you think uh, defines success as a sales rep? That's a very good, very good point. Making sure that you know what's important in your professional growth or to grow in your profession as a sales rep and to make, uh, to put up big numbers and to put yourself in a position to take on more responsibility and kind of move up the uh, executive ladder or whatever your goal is. You gotta be able to be in tune with what your boss is expecting and what they wanna, what, what's important to them. You know, that kind of gets back to what we talked about earlier, kind of servant leadership and, you know, hopefully everybody's in a, good situation where they're, um, you know, have a boss and we, not, all, not everybody's like this and I've, I've been, I've worked for different types of bosses throughout the years uh, and I've been a different boss throughout the years. I think when I first started managing, you know, I, I didn't, I wanted to, I wanted everybody to be me. I wanted to clone what I did as a sales rep and make them, and make them all do that. That does not work. So when you get your first opportunity to manage, you got to remember you have to allow your reps to have the freedom to find success. Um, so here's, my kind of mantra, treat people the way you want to be treated. Again, that was, I'm not a classic polished sales guy. I just treat people well and I want to, and I listen to them and I find out what's important to them. In sports, you know, I, th I have a theory that the three most important things to the average American's life is God, family, and sports, and maybe not, not necessarily in that order. So you got to remember, and I got this from working a couple years back in, um, New York with the Giants and helping move their season ticket base to the new building. And it's traditionally a lot of blue collar fans up there and they're very passionate about their Giants and they're very passionate about their teams. And so you gotta remember like that you, as a ticket sales rep, you're one of the only voices that the average fan can get to and to hear things and, and, and you know, find out inside information or whatever and kind of feel connected to their team and kind of in, in, enhance that. So customer relationships is, is big for me. You really want to try to listen, understand, have a conversation with your customers, find out what's important to them. You know, once you have this kind of rapport with them, then you're able to you know, ask for referrals, you're able to cross sell everybody. That's again, a key to selling number one goals. You want to sell, you need to put up money, right? So how do reps really get big at that? They cross sell, you know, they have a season ticket holder or a full season ticket holder and they talk to them about a group outing or they talk to them about a nightly suite rental or they talk to them about who entertains clients. You've ever looked at one of our luxury options, things like that. Um, that is, is really the, the key there is to understand it across sell. 
And once you have that kind of rapport with your customers and understand what's important to them, you can grow them and keep them and keep them going year to year to year to year. And that's, it's always harder to keep a, or easier to keep somebody than to lose them and get them back. Right, Bill? Um, this is a uh, photo that I Google imaged of a, clearly a Kansas City Chiefs ticket sales rep that's mingling out in the crowd, probably in the parking lot, a tailgate or whatever. This is a very important step to getting to know your customers, in my eye. I think when we all work in the sports business, we forget how freaking cool it is to work in the sports business and to go to a stadium or to be in a stadium. So I always make it a habit, and I've done this for a long time. A friend of mine, Colin Faulkner, with the Cubs, and I kind of developed this theory back in the day at the Rangers, um, that I go out in the, in the seating bowl and just meet people and go visit my customers. And all you have to simply do is say, hey, thanks for coming out. you have any questions? That's all you have to do. And then, oh, wow, someone from the front office you know, came, by to, came by to say hello, to check on my needs. And that's how you can kind of, I'm a big believer in kind of, that's why I like Twitter so much, because it's grassroots, it's one fan at a time kind of guerrilla marketing and taking, you know, winning one fan at a time. Um, getting out into your seating bowl and, and interming, intermingling with your season ticket holders and with your clients and with just some guy in the upper deck that's there with his kid. That touch point is going to build a relationship potentially with that fan. You never know where that guy works, what he does, where his kid plays little league, football, whatever, you know, what they could, where they go to church, what kind of groups. So it's all about kind of having that touch point in the stadium or in the arena or in the ballpark. Um, so we kind of talked about, we've, we've heard a lot about, um, you know, what defines success and how you become a successful salesperson, right? I'm a big believer that um, you have to try to put everything kind of out in front of you. So you've learned things from your boss, for example. He tells you this is how to, how to sell and how to be successful. Um, you know, professors from school, you've learned. Um, sales trainers like Bill Grutin and Brett and, you know, others. And um, I don't think he's here. Anyway. Um, and then books, and then uh, mentors, and then you have to put together, and then coworkers. I think this is an important one too. So the whole idea is, I think that as a sales rep, when you're, you have to have the the flexibility, and you want to be able to um, find your own style. That didn't really wash out. There's a great book called Presenting to Win by Jerry Wasserman. That would not be a slide that he would highlight because you really can't see that kind of washed out. So I'm sorry about that. Um, Jim Kaler would be disappointed in my efforts. Um, but you have to be able to kind of find success and, and kind of put together the style that works for you. As I had mentioned earlier about, you know, I was never one of those sales reps that just kind of blew out phone calls. I took the time to kind of understand my clients a little bit better and kind of talk to them and, and understand their needs and kind of grew that way. But the coworkers one is big because you can find out what's working for them or what's not working for them and try to put that into your style. It's kind of a, you know, I, I used to, I like to say, just kind of put everything out on a desk in front of you and you got to kind of pick and choose what style is going to work for you and what is going to be successful. And again, the goal is, number one goal is to sell and bring in revenue. That's going to open up opportunities down the road for your career. All right. This is a really big one for me. Um, and I used to talk to my sales reps a lot when I was running a shop about, look, get out in the community and meet people, get involved. You know, if you're a runner, go join a running club. If you're a bowler, go join a bowling league, play softball, go to church, join you know, you know, young Republicans, young Democrats, or whatever. Just get out and get involved because when you're selling sports, everybody's a potential client, right? Right? Everybody, right? <laughs> Um, so now you can really do that. We can, we're going to talk a little bit about doing that in the community, but you can really do that through developing your personal, your personal brand. Who, who's on Twitter in here? Just about everybody. Everybody should be on Twitter. Who's on LinkedIn in here? And I know we're going to talk about LinkedIn. I think there's some LinkedIn guys over here. LinkedIn is... Uh, by far a really, one of the better tools, if not the best tool to find out insight and to look for common threads that you can start a conversation. Look, it's hard to start a conversation or get something going, kind of building that rapport with, um, 
with a client out of thin air. So if you can do a little bit of um, understanding of you know, looking at them and, and you can do it openly. Remember, when you're working for a team like the 49ers, you have a nice brand in the community. People want to talk to you. So if you have your LinkedIn profile and you're looking at people at different businesses and, oh man, someone at the 49ers is checking me out on LinkedIn. That's a, that kind of resonates with somebody at some point. Or you can you know, turn down the controls and you can kind of sleuth and uh, check out people and find, look for common uh, conversation points and things like that. But here's the number one thing about LinkedIn is that what does it say about who you are? Like, is your profile 100% complete? And it, so if someone were to Google, if you, I don't know what, ha, I don't, you guys are LinkedIn over here somewhere, right? LinkedIn and Google have this really great relationship. I don't know what happened, but if you Google your first and last name, your LinkedIn profile is gonna sh show up in like the top three or four every single time. So what you wanna think about is what does my LinkedIn profile say about me as a potential person that someone wants to do business with. If it's incomplete, if it doesn't look good, if it's not there, everybody in this room should have LinkedIn. If you don't, go get on one today. Um, you know, what does it say about you? But then here's the number one thing about building your brand within LinkedIn is that, and social media in general, is don't try to sell anything. All you're doing is building relationships with people that could one day lead to sales. So when you're in LinkedIn and you're in these groups or you know, they made it so much, they've definitely flipped the model in the last kind of 18 months with LinkedIn and made it a lot more um, personal and kind of engaging where they want everybody to kind of you know, click, a, click like or join a conversation. They give you the daily pop-ups now that congratulate somebody on a work anniversary, things like that. Those kind of things you want to make habit of being involved in that and getting your name out there. You want people used to seeing your name. You used to back in the day when Bill and I learned how to sell, um, you used to go to networking events and you'd give your business card to everybody and your goal was to have your business card on the top of everybody's um, desk because they go, oh, I know somebody over there at the Sacramento Kings, where's that card? Now your goal is to have your digital footprint on as many laptops, desktops, um, you know, smartphones as possible. So you do that by engaging and making it a habit of diving into conversations and um, sharing content um, within LinkedIn. Okay, so then Twitter, Twitter to me is a business tool 100% all the time. Um, you know, it's, it's a place where I don't tweet very much original content, but I say that often, but you very rarely will see me tweet outside of a Twitter chat or outside of where I'm just making a comment and kind of facilitating along the conversation that someone shared. So if there's something I wanna say about what I'm trying to do, um, or what I want a message out there, I'll find an article that said it, or I'll find someone that I'm following that's tweeting about that topic and I'll retweet that. And again, Twitter's now easier to make comments and uh, add a little insight. You just wanna get people in these social media places used to seeing your name so they go, oh, my boss just gave me the green light to spend money on a X. Um, who do I know at that team? So you wanna have your kind of name out there top of mind. All right, I'm a still a big believer in the old school community networking, getting out and getting involved. I see so many sales reps and people that, in this room that manage people for a living will see this. You see a lot of folks that move to your market to move through your team to their first or second job in sports. They don't get out, they make all their friends within the room. And then what happens with that is when they have a bad day, they have nobody to outlet to because all their friends are coworkers. So you want to get out in the community, A, because I'm a big believer in nice, well-rounded sales reps that are friendly and popular or successful. You know, they, they, um, they have friends and they understand that building this network of people in the community and friends in the community, whether it's your alumni group or fraternity, sorority, your church or whatever, meeting people and being active and giving back and kind of getting out in the community is only gonna build that pool of people that could potentially buy from you. Um, and then the other thing too is, big believer in kind of developing your voice and building your personal brand. So, you know, if there's a chance to maybe do a blog post for your university that you went to, or, you know, um, your fraternity, your sorority, or something like that, Try to, try to find a way to produce some content and start getting your name out there. Not just now, but as you're going through your career. Um, there's a lot of great Twitter chats um, that take place. I actually started 
Ron Petronio and I started uh, Social for Tick Sales about four and a half years ago, and we do a weekly Twitter chat on just ticket sales best practices. And it's probably the smartest thing that both of us have done, for me for sure, the smartest thing I've done in the last five years besides going back to grad school is starting this chat and getting on Twitter because I go to events like this and people know me. And it's created a lot of opportunities. Uh, SB chat, which is sports business chat, Sunday nights, another really good chat to kind of get your name out there nationally and try to share best practices and things like that because me as a servant leader, leader I want to make sure that you're out there and trying to develop opportunities and networking and meeting people that, again, could be people you could work with one day, hire one day, um, you know, 10 years from now be working with them. So you want to kind of get out and get involved and, and build your voice and build your personal brand. All right. Let's talk about learning. Who in this room can honestly say that they try to do something every day to get better at their job? One, one person. What do you do? Yeah. Uh, I read a lot of Great. Who else? What about this side of the room? Who else does something, did something this week to make themselves better at their job? I will tell you that I was, I don't know, four years into this business or whatever, and I kind of made the commitment to really kind of self-learn and self-teach um, myself, and I got promoted four times in about five years. So once you really kind of, you know, once you're selling, and number one goal, selling and putting up numbers, then you can focus then on continually learning and finding best practices and trying to find out how to do your craft better. And there's a lot of great books out there that, these are a few that have influenced me, Good to Great. It's a great, uh, great book. You've got to get the people on the bus and put them in the right role. And then uh, you know, surround yourself with good people. Uh, the Thank You Economy by Gary Vandercheck. If you want to know, first of all, he's a tremendous overcusser. So if, you don't, if you're sensitive to these kind of things, you don't want to check out Gary Vandercheck. But he's a really smart guy in, in as far as social media and kind of building your brand. So this was a book, The Thank You Economy, that really opened up my eyes to the power of Twitter and the power of social media. So um, that's one I would recommend to check out. Uh, winning the customer, this is just customer service 101, which is again, treat people like you want to be treated, kind of my philosophy. Um, anything you can kind of find out about customer service and trying to figure out trends and things like that. Uh, this is a really good book for all the marketers in the, in the, in the house, but the long tail you know, the whole idea of now it's so easy to kind of sell and, and, and reach people all the way out the tail of your business. You, you can, I, I was, again, I was a John Spolster full season ticket kind of guy, 101, right? But now I understand the power of partial season tickets and selling. I talk to my sales reps and, you know, at Sports Desk, we talk about this a lot, is that we, I t talk to my sales reps about sell people what they want to buy. Just get them in the door, give them great service, win them over, turn them into a long-term fan. So um, that kind of goes with the philosophy at the long tail. You no longer have to just hit this segment of people right here. You can create packages and offers and customer service touch points and things like that that are all the way out here on the other end of the tail. So if you've never read this, read this book or seen this book, it's a really good book. And then here's the Google Alerts for you, for you over here with the setting up a Google Alert. Who's that Google Alerts set up? to get returns. You can do you know, ticket sales, um, you know, social selling, uh, different things. You can also do very specific things for in your market when you're looking for leads. Um, it's a great way to kind of find what's going on um, with businesses that are announcing that they're growing and things like that. So having a Google alert kind of system. Now it's a lot easier than it used to be, but I used to bomb Every two weeks or so, I'd go through the Starbucks on a, I'm sorry, through the um, Barnes and Noble. And everybody's a sales expert, a leadership expert, a management expert, social media expert, things like that. So there's a ton of content, a ton of books out there. So if you blow past that main section with all, the, all those books and go to the bargain books, 
you can buy a lot of books for two dollars, four dollars, six dollars, things like that, that might have just two or three kind of takeaways that you can help to try to build and learn from. So that's a really good strategy, I think, to um, you know check out the Barnes and Noble every week, every month or so, just to kind of look for different books that you could look at. If you could find one or two or three nuggets out of it that you can incorporate that's going to make you better at your job, it's going to build you as a professional, that's smart. All right, oh, let's, let's talk about uh, the formal kind of, who, who in here has a master's degree? Okay, a few people. Who, who's, who, let me see everybody that hires. How impactful or what difference does a master's degree from undergrad degree make in your eye? Very, very little. Thumbs down over here. Why? Tell what you've done or what you can do. So rather than just books, theory, kind of things like that. Is there a right time or a wrong time to go back to get your master's if you were going to do that? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's a really good point that, that when you're getting hired, I mean, I, I, I will talk to a lot of undergrads that are looking to break into the sports business, and they talk about, you know, oh, should I go to grad school, you know, right away? And I'm like, look, I look at a resume when I'm hiring somebody, it doesn't matter if you went to grad school or not. When you're first getting your job, the most important thing about getting a, in this, being successful in the sports business is getting your foot in the door being, you know, getting that first job, selling, and then kind of growing from there. As you guys will learn, the younger folks in this room, everybody knows everybody in this business. So it's very easy to kind of move around and get going like that. Yes, Ben. I think it's going to be an interesting question in five years when the younger people who have masters become directors in this business or managers in this business. Because maybe they'll have gone through their education route and that becomes it. Yeah. Here's the thing about, so you know, there's, there's several schools out there. Everybody knows, you know, UMass and Oregon and Ohio. So I will tell you that I went back after 19 years from undergrad to grad school and got my master's about two years ago at Ohio. And it was very, very impactful because having that five to 19 year gap between undergrad and grad school, it really, and having some real world experience, really um, makes it a lot more impactful that you um, know what you're learning and why it's important. So again, it's this whole idea of kind of continually learning and trying to get better at your craft. Going back and getting a formal education at one of these universities or whichever university kind of fits your needs. You have to have a plan, we're gonna talk about that in a minute with uh, having a plan. And if you're gonna go back to grad school, you know, it's not the right decision for everybody. It was great for me, because I went to Ohio, and Ohio's got a tremendous network of alumni and resources to kind of draw on to get better at what you do. But you wanna go to a school, you, want it, you don't wanna get it just to get it, you wanna get it with a plan in mind. So you wanna try to go to one of these schools that are really connected, um, that could really give you the resources so after your career. So you want to fit, you want to, again, pick the one that kind of fits your needs and kind of have a plan if you're going to go. Is there anybody that's like adamantly against, never even thought about getting your master's that wants to explain why or how, why, how come? Nobody? So again, it's just that whole idea of learning and trying to get better at your craft. You should never be complacent in your role, I think, because when that happens, then you start to um, get overtaken by people. And in this business, you have a lot of senior management, ownership changes, and things like that. So if you're a guy that's complacent or a gal that's complacent in their role, then all of a sudden you could be on a short list for losing your, your opportunity or losing your job and having to look for something else. Yeah.
you know, again, I think that's just about getting an MBA, I think, could be smart, but strategically you want to go to a school that's going to give you the most upside connections, potentials, and things like that. Um, you know, that's some of the advantages that getting a, your master's or even your MBA with a sports management focus at one of these programs that, that does that could give you a, a broader swath of connections you can get to than getting your, but the actual, the formal education, it's all about finding those nuggets in your education that's going to, that you're going to use every day. For me, it was really the leadership class that I took at Ohio really kind of opened my eyes up. I think I was, a, I know I was a really, really good manager, but maybe I wasn't necessarily a great leader all the time. And making that subtle shift and understanding what the difference is between managing and leading um, really kind of helped accelerate, um, you know, the buy-in that I had from my staff and the people that work for me. I mean, I've got a lot of people that have worked for me in the past that are very loyal and want to, you know, always want to know where I'm going because they want to come work for me again. So, you know, that's something that I learned, you know, in a class. But I could have learned that in MBA. I could have learned that in a sports admin class. It's just about getting, finding that information that you can apply, you know, every day. The, you know, the, there was a management class about the hedgehog theory management. You know, this is something that I focus on when I'm at a team is really, I think a lot of us get so caught up in the latest and greatest way to sell tickets instead of focusing on the simpleness of selling tickets day to day. Give great service, sell people what they want to buy, win them over as a fan, turn them into a long-term fan and keep their business. You know, I think focusing on that, those little things. So again, you want to find one that, oh wait. Oh, well I would, if you're going to find one, I would definitely go back to Ohio because you know, you can fill up your, your roses with the Ohio family, so. <laughs> uh, all right, so Troy, how much time do I have? Uh-oh. Well, these are the last two. This is my last slide. Troy was getting after me because I had too many slides because he didn't want everybody sitting here reading the slides. So I said, there's really nothing on the slides. It's just me coming up here talking. But two things that I would, you really need to focus on to develop your career is setting goals. So, um, Number one is setting goals. So you should have that one year kind of goal. Remember mine was, I want to be number one in one category and number in the top three in every other category in the sales room when I was learning how to sell. And when I was coming up through the sales room. And then you kind of want to have, okay, once you establish, what's the rule number one? Selling, right? You gotta, you gotta sell and put up revenue, and bring in revenue to create other opportunities. Um, once you have that, kind of have a three year plan, five year plan, long term plan. Who, who knows what they want to do 15 years from now? Anybody? What do you want to do? I'd like to serve as a senior administrator for an outlet. Okay, awesome. I'm a big believer in setting goals and achieving goals. Um, I'm not a big believer in setting up a backup plan. You have a backup plan? You have a, you have a plan B? Plan B. Uh, I've gone through a couple. I saw an interesting video blog or whatever on Bo Jackson was walking around Kansas City Ballpark and people didn't know who he was. Bo Jackson was probably the greatest, could have been the single greatest baseball player or single greatest football player of all time if he wouldn't play either one and didn't get hurt. But I saw an interview with him that changed my life when I was, didn't change my life, but it had a big influence on my life because people were always tell him, you gotta pick, you gotta pick, you can't have both. And he just said, look, I'm gonna play both at the highest level because that's my goal. He, and he said something that stuck with me, he said, look, I think people that aren't successful in life say, you know what, I'm going to do this, but if not, I can always go work for dad in the shop. And having a backup plan, people tend to fall back to that. So I would encourage you to kind of set a goal and go for it, you know, go for it hard and, and you know, do it. Because I think when you set up things to fail, then you're going to go to the right here and you're going to potentially fail. Okay, I know i got three minutes left or so, but mentorship, this is a really big one for me. And I, every, everybody in this room should be a, looking for a mentor, and then depending on what level you are, you should definitely be giving back and mentoring back. I think the biggest key and the quickest way to find a mentor is just ask for advice. Look, at, look for somebody and find somebody that's in a role that you admire that you want to be at one day, and reach out to them. It's so easy to have like LinkedIn, Twitter, Periscope, you can Periscope them now. Um, you know, and reach out to these people and just simply ask for their advice. Hey, how, how did you find success? 
I'm, I'm in this role, you're in a role that I admire, or that I'd like to be at one day, what success is to be fun? And you've got to try to find that mentorship and find somebody that um, will help you and be invested in, your, in the growth of your career. So that's something I would encourage you to have multiple kind of mentors. And then depending on what level you're at, I'm a huge believer in, and certain we should all be giving back to this community, to this, uh, to this industry and growing the future. So I have many, many, Ben will tell you this, Ben's probably reached out to me on LinkedIn before and um, you know, picked up the phone and had a conversation. And I've had a lot of people that just reach out to me and go, hey, can I ask you a question about this or career advice or whatever? And I think that it's important to find that time to be able to give back and help mentor and help build, um, you know, build the future leaders of this industry. So, what questions do we have? Thanks for, I'm not, a, I'm not a very good presenter, I'm kind of clunky, I think. So, but I will tell you that, you know, I'm not a classic presenter, I'm not a classic salesperson, but I found a way to be successful in this business. And that, you know, Again, focusing on selling, number one, and putting up new revenues is gonna create opportunities. Learning, getting yourself better, and then developing a plan of attack and a mentor and, and you know, execute that plan, I think is the three things that have helped me through my career, and I think they could help everyone here. Questions? Thoughts? Am I done? Wait, question. Well, it's so easy now with your little smartphones to be in the line at Chipotle or Starbucks in the morning or whatever and just engaging with people. So I make it, um, you know, for LinkedIn within the communities and the groups and things like that, I mean, I think you should spend 30 minutes a day at some point on there, you know, um, engaging in these groups and kind of building your voice. And again, you're not trying to sell anything. You're just getting people used to seeing your name so that you're top of mind when they want to buy something from you. But um, to me, it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's constant. I'm on my phone a lot, but I'm not a, Troy King, Troy Kirby is the king of, of Twitter in my eye. I, I use it a little more strategic at that time, because again, I don't believe in, when I first got on Twitter, I was like, I don't, nobody cares who, who I am. You know, they don't want to hear from me. I'm not an expert, I don't know anything. I just try to give as much advice and things like that. So I rarely treat, I basically am a facilitator, I'm a pastor with content, right? Is what I, the approach that I try to take. I try to take content that I think is important to the business and to getting people better and pass that content through to my followers and to other people. So with that, it's easy to kind of just always be, you know, looking for articles and things like that. I have the, those Google alerts set up for ticket sales best practices and social selling and things like that. If there's a good article, I tweet it out. So it's just kind of a, uh, you know, the, the commitment that you have to make to find 30 to minutes a day at some point to just kind of be on there. I always find scheduled tweets to be good too. Tweet deck. I hate that. I, I schedule them so that way they don't all come out at once and you don't have a gobbledygook of uh, 30 articles at once. I, I hate that because uh, I think the thing that, that makes Twitter genius is because it's authentic and it's you. And I think. Troy does a tremendous job. Don't get me wrong, Troy. I'm not knocking what you do. You do a great job, but there's a lot of people that mismanage that, and it comes out being kind of blunt, not personalized, not, you know, just tweeting. I'll look for articles that Troy will tweet, and I'll retweet it with, oh, great content. Thanks for sharing, things like that. And that's that little extra thing that you don't get sometimes with those scheduled kind of tweets. Any other questions? What about you? You got a question? All right.